Uh, thank you, David. So as he said, I'm Leah McGuire. I work at Salesforce on the Einstein team. So Salesforce is a very large company, and Einstein is sort of the blanket term for everything that involves predictions or machine learning or AI. Um, but I actually work on the platform side of Einstein, so building the platform that all of those predictions are served on. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about low-touch machine learning, and that may uh, cause you to ask, basically, what's the, what's the low-touch about? And you've heard that AI is taking over the world, and so what I would say is that it's not actually taking over the world unless we can find an army of humans to build that AI, right? Because every chatbot that you hear about that goes on the internet and gets broken and turned racist in under a day represents hundreds of thousands of hours of researchers' times in order to produce that. So it's still a very labor-intensive process to produce any predictions. And so what we're trying to do with Salesforce Einstein is basically take this black art where you send your researcher off with some eye of newt and some dried toads, they come back a couple months later with a model that you can't understand and you can't change into a very scientific process where basically we've taken the repetitive parts, we've, we've standardized things, and uh, basically anyone who is a Salesforce customer can go ahead and get a predictive uh, application for their particular use case. And so if you break down the way building machine learning applications typically works, it looks something like this, right? So you start with feature engineering, which any data scientist will tell you is 80 to 90% of the work, basically going through your data, looking at uh, what would be a good, good feature for this particular use case. Uh, once you've done that, you maybe try and feed your features into a model and evaluate that model, then decide your model's not good enough, try a different model, or maybe add new features. Uh, you go through this loop a couple of times, and eventually you may get to the point where you actually get to deploy your model. And depending on what language you've used, what your setup is, this may involve handing it off to a different person to completely rewrite it in another language, which is, again, very time consuming. And, of course, you have to make sure that you not only deployed it once, but you actually managed to get the model in a state where you can retrain as necessary and produce predictions whenever you want. So, as you can see, this requires a lot of time, a lot of effort for one or many people. And if you think about the fact that Salesforce is a B2B company, so we have many customers who all want different applications, this obviously doesn't scale, right? So you try and produce N applications, there just aren't enough data scientists in Silicon Valley for Salesforce to hire, let alone uh, for every other company to produce all these applications. So what we started asking ourselves is, does everyone really need this handmade model? So handmade is wonderful. You think of a Rolls Royce, it's a beautiful car, but you don't necessarily need a Rolls Royce in order to get to work, right? You just need a car. Uh, so can we productionalize this, this handmade uh, sort of uh, system that people go through and make uh, something that we can make available to everyone? So the first place to look is, again, at this, this sort of framework of what people do when they're making a machine learning model and ask, well, can we do anything about feature engineering? Can we standardize this, standardize this and make it easier? And the answer is yes, if you have metadata about what your features are, right? So you don't just get a blank set of, of data in a table that says this is a string, you, s you know that this particular string happens to be an email address, so you can split it into the prefix and the domain, match the prefix to the user that you think it should belong to, try and match the domain to the company that you think that person comes, to, comes from. Um, so when you have additional information about the data, you can really automate these steps that a human would go in and find that information, sort of use their intuition and build it up. If you have that information, you can standardize it and do it automatically. So similarly, if you have geolocation, you can extract the city or um, join it with weather data to get the information about the weather. If you know that a particular no numeric value is currency, you can go ahead and map that into a common unit so that you can actually do comparisons. Of course, if you've done this automation of feature engineering, you actually need to add an additional step to this model. And that's uh, basically, Sanity checking. So you need to make sure that you haven't made some crazy features since you made them automatically. And what that means is really, if you think about it, each and every Salesforce customer is a unique and special flower. And so 
all of their data is different, which is wonderful if you're the database administrator and you're trying to make something that works for your particular use case. It's absolutely horrible if you're the data scientist trying to build models off of this, right? Because every single person's data is different. And so what you end up with is this giant mess uh, of this bottom, bottom picture where, you know, imagine that this is all your data, but the white petals are actually rotten, and so you need to throw them out. So you need to have a step in your, your data processing where you look and say, all right, so this was the metadata that I had. These are the feature values that I had. Do those actually make sense? Do I have the appropriate values and ranges for the, the information that I think is contained in this particular column? And further, because we're doing this without a good knowledge of the underlying business processes, it becomes very hard to distinguish cause and effect. So you need ways of basically detecting if there's some future knowledge leaking into your model to make it worthless. So an example of that would be if you're trying to predict whether or not um, someone will be contacted, and after they're contacted, you fill in the address, the address would be perfectly predictive of that contact information, but absolutely useless for the model. So you need to throw out that kind of information and make sure it's not contaminating your models. So once you've done that and basically groomed your features, you can go on to the next step. And this is what people typically think of when they think of AutoML, um, which is basically trying different models, evaluating, and trying, trying more models. So, you may have heard that Random Forest has the best on average performance of any model, um, but it's not necessarily the case that Random Forest will perform the best for your particular use case. So for any particular application that you're doing, there's an appropriate set of models that might have good predictive power. And in order to find the best one, you really need to try those models. And each model has many different uh, knobs that you can turn, so hyperparameters. And it's important to go ahead and basically make sure that you've turned those knobs to the appropriate level so that your model is performing as, as well as it possibly can. So what we've done is we've, we've basically automated this process. There are many ways that you could do this. You can achieve this with a simple grid search, or you can do it with something more specific, uh, sophisticated like Bayesian algorithms. Um, but basically, you need to try many different models in order to find the best one for every use case. So those are the pieces that we automated, um, but I really haven't said anything about how we did this. Uh, and it's a short talk, so obviously I can't go into a lot of detail, but what I can tell you is a little bit about how we did this. So one of the important things was that we basically didn't want to spend time reinventing the wheel, right? So all of human achievement is based on standing on the shoulders of others. If you go ahead and redo things that have already been well solved, you're not going to make any headway. And so when we set out to build these, this automation of machine learning, the question became, well, what platform do we build on? So a quick search of the internet will reveal that there are one or two machine learning tools out there. And in fact, half of these uh, companies on the slide are basically from within the last three years. So it's by no means a solved problem. So if you, if you do this search and then you're trying to figure out, well, what do I want to build on? What's the best solution for me? Uh, there's uh, some things you can consider. So the first is, again, going back to this diagram, some of these, these uh, platforms will solve different parts of this with different, different fidelity. So some of them don't have very good feature engineering. Uh, the algorithms may be better on some platforms than others. Uh, there may or may not be support for uh, model evaluation built in. And of course, some of, these, some of these machine learning frameworks are actually just for playing uh, and model development. They're not actually for production, so you'll end up rewriting your, your code in order to deploy. But this, this diagram that I've been showing you is, of course, not the full <laughs> picture. So before you can even do feature engineering, you have to do ETL, right? You have to get your data into the form where you can then do feature engineering on it. And it turns out that everyone seems to want real-time. Whether or not they actually need real-time, they want real-time. And <laughs> there are legitimately some use cases where if you can't produce predictions in real-time, your model is not actually valuable. So you probably have to support uh, real-time as well. So another search of the internet will reveal that there are many more solutions for ETL in real-time, right? Uh, so how do you go about <laughs> choosing between all of these possible options? How do you build the right infrastructure for you? Uh, and if you're smart, you realize what conference we're at, and you may have noticed that one, one thing appeared on, the on both of those slides, and that is Spark. 
So we chose to build our um, system in Spark for a number of reasons. And the first is that Spark scales really well. Uh, so we have both very, very small customers and customers who are, have millions and millions of rows. And so we can basically use the same code across those customers and just change a couple of parameters and the Spark will run, which is wonderful. Uh, the other point is that Spark has very good machine learning libraries, so we're not going to waste our time re-implementing algorithms that have been implemented over and over and over again. Uh, good for ETL and streaming. Uh, and, of course, Spark has an incredibly healthy and active user base, so um, it's always getting better, which is wonderful. And, in fact, we actually really enjoy writing code in Scala and Spark, so that was a big selling point. So what this ended up looking like is uh, we automated part of this in terms of the feature engineering model uh, checking and evaluation, and then we used Spark to get the rest of it for free. So, I mean, sadly, ETL is never free, but at least by using Spark, we didn't have to spool up a separate, uh, separate system in order to do our ETL. And because we did our uh, training and evaluation, all of our model building in Spark, basically we didn't have to rewrite the code in order to go to production. You might clean up your code, hopefully you clean up your code, but you don't have to rewrite it into a different language. So uh, deploying to production is basically a part of automation that we get for free using Spark. Uh, similarly, you can produce predictions and update your models very easily. And uh, with Spark structured streaming, you can use the same code in order to produce real-time predictions. So that's a big selling point. And with this system of automation, Salesforce is currently producing almost half a billion uh, predictions a day. And we're deploying uh, many apps to production without a data scientist interfering. And so I should say that this graph used to have a y-axis. PR made me take it off, um, but it's not a small number. So <laughs> we, are, we are producing uh, these applications where basically a data scientist laid out the framework for what the application should be, and then a Salesforce customer said, all right, I want this application, go and, go and build it for me, and then it was done without the data scientist going back and doing any hand tweaking for that customer. So automatically, the, the customer just said, yes, I want this prediction, and we built it for them. And so what this means is that basically, uh, we can stop reinventing the wheel, so by, by taking all of the repetitive processes that are involved in machine learning and standardizing them and uh, basically making them more uh, modular, we can start working higher up the stack and spend our time working on uh, more important things than basically doing the same feature engineering over and over again. And what this ev eventually means is that we've taken the time needed to build a machine learning application for many months of a specialist time to a couple of hours of someone with domain expertise knowledge time uh, so that everyone who needs it can have machine learning uh, predictions for their particular use case. So, thank you. <laughs>